um, start. Hello and welcome again to Burns Night um, 2. Uh, this is the second time um, we've um, run this and I'm very excited to welcome you all uh, to an evening of um, toasts which are going to explore the life and work of Robert Burns and his legacy uh, but also sort of wider things about Scottish romanticism and then we're going to sort of settle into uh, a sort of relaxed and convivial evening of sort of sharing some um, poetry and ideas. So on that sort of entry screen, uh, we deliberately deleted a, a set of instructions about putting Q um, in the chat to ask a question, uh, because we're not taking questions um, this evening. We're doing some toasts. We're inviting you to um, toast with us. We're sharing some poetry, uh, which I think is going to be great fun. And I've suggested that instead of a Q, we could, re we, we could, we could use a P. Um, in the chat if you want to read out a poem. So hopefully you sort of might come in um, ready to um, read out a poem. If there is a dry spell, I think so, some of us are ready uh, with um, things to read out. So if you want to avoid um, being recited to by me, essentially, uh, go and get some poems um, now. No, you should stay and listen to uh, the toasts and we'll give you a bit of time to, to find a poem um, shortly. So. I'm just going to give sort of brief and relatively personal introductions uh, to everybody who's speaking uh, and then I'm going to address the haggis uh, apologies in advance for my Scottish accent in spite of my um, Scottish surname I sound like an English person reciting Burns rather than a Scottish person uh, but I'm going to inflict that on you and then you're going to desperately want to get a poem um, to read instead of me instead of hearing me again uh, then we're going to have uh, the immortal memory um, given to you by uh, Jenny Orr, who's a senior lecturer in 18th century literature at Newcastle. Um, she's worked on Robert Burns and his relationship with Ireland. Uh, she also works on literary networks in Ireland, but also sort of around the world, France, America in particular. Um, and on a more personal note, I'm not going to describe her as a sister from another mister because that raises uh, sort of unwarranted um, genealogical problems, but at one point she did describe me as a brother from another mother, which made me feel warm and cuddly inside. Um, then we're going to go to um, the traditional toasts that structure a Burns evening, and we're going to hear uh, the toast to the lassies from Gerard McKeever. Um, Jerry's um, first book, Dialectics of Improvement on Scottish Romanticism, won the first, uh, won the bar's first book prize. Uh, so it's going to be very exciting to um, hear from him. And even though he's doing Dry January, you could ask him about his amazing selection of single malts just to make him feel um, relatively bad about his poor life decisions. Um, and then we're going to hear the response to the laddies um, from Rita Dashwood, who is my postdoctoral research fellow in the Romantic uh, Ridiculous, um, but also works on women, um, property and the novel from Jane Austen um, onwards. Uh, and she's going to talk a little bit about her work on Susan Ferrier um, this evening. And then we're going to hear some sort of, of the traditional sort of entertainment poems, uh, or we're going to hear some poems uh, as traditional entertainments uh, in the latter part of um, this Burns Night. We're going to hear from Angela Wright, who's just there for me, probably not for you. Um, uh, but Angela is Professor in Romantic Literature at Sheffield. Uh, she's doing really exciting uh, work um, on uh, the history of the Gothic and also an edited set of um, Anne Radcliffe's, uh, which looks really exciting. Um, and is like a, a model of how to be a, a, um, a an academic um, for me to, to bring that sort of more personal um, note in. And then finally, we're hopefully going to have um, Ainsley McIntosh, although she might have been having some technical uh, issues, um, also doing um, some poetry for, uh, for us. And a Ainsley is sort of uh, first and foremost, this isn't really true, but first and foremost, my drinking buddy, uh, but also uh, now Daphne Jackson, a uh, research fellow at the University of Edinburgh doing really exciting work on the secret lives of manuscripts. Um, so that is the lineup for this evening. Now I'm going to inflict my horrible English accent uh, butchering uh, Robert Burns at the start of this Burns night. For, to, to sort of, so I apologise to him and I apologise to you uh, while I address the haggis. Um, so yeah, apologies. So it goes. Fair for your honest somsy face, great chieftain of the pudding race, aboon them all you take your place, paint, tripe or them. well are you worthy of a grace as langs my am. The groaning trencher there you fill, your hurdies like a distant hill, your pin would do to mend a mill in time of need, while through your pores the dews distill like amber bead. His knife see rustic labour dight, um, and 
cut you up with ready slight, trenching um, your gushing entrails bright like oni dish. And then, uh, oh, what a wondrous sight, warm, reeking, re rich. Then spoon for spoon, they stretch and strive. You'll take the hindmost, on they drive, till all their wheel-swelled kites belive are bent like drums. And then, old goodman, maced like to writhe, the thank it hums. Is there the o'er his French ragu, or oleo that would store a sou, or fricassee would make her spew with perfect sconner, looks down with sneering scorn for view on such a dinner? Poor devil, see him over his trash, as feckless as a withered rash. Um, his spindle shank a good whip lash, his neve a knit, through bloody flood and field to dash, oh how unfit. But mark the rustic, haggis fed, the trembling earth resounds his tread. Clap in his welly neve a blade, he'll make it whistle, and legs and arms and heads will sned like taps of thristle. Ye powers who make mankind your care, and dish them up their, your bill of fare, their bill of fare. Um, old Scotland wants nay skinking ware that dropsy luggies, but if you wish her grateful prayer, give her a haggis. Thank you. And over to Jenny, who's going to give the immortal memory. Thank you very much, Andy. I think he deserves a round of applause. That was pretty good undertaking there. So, ladies, gentlemen, everyone in between, it's an absolute honour to give the immortal memory of Robert Burns tonight. Um, as Andy said, I came to the work of Burns as part of my doctoral research into Irish romantic poetry, and particularly circles of poets who were contemporaries with Robert Burns. Um, and I had the pleasure of conducting this research in the Centre for Robert Burns Studies at the University of Glasgow, where many of you will know Gerard Carruthers and his team are undertaking an absolutely mammoth work of editing scholarship on Burns's collective works which promises to bring us closer to Burns the man and Burns the creative genius than ever before. And most recently, we're learning about the care that Robert Burns took in preserving his textual record, revealing a consciousness of legacy and of the significance of his artistry that challenges the contemporary literary persona of the heaven-taught plowman. Now, it's become a bit of a cliche to say that Scottish writing is distinguished by its embodiment of the spirit of the people. Fellow poet Andrew O'Hagan observed that, can a single poet summon the essence of a nation? What are we asking of a poet when we imagine them representative souls of nations formed out of chaos and motivated by difference? Perhaps though, it's Burns' dynamic quality, his ability to capture life in all its fullness, as well as the political significance of his work, which has earned him lasting international status. His appeal is universal, as well as in the particular. And as the Scottish novelist George MacDonald put it, everyone capable of judging knew that Burns belongs not to Scotland alone, but to all the world that can understand him. And it's true that Burns's poetry has always traveled well, being translated in over 40 languages worldwide, from Russia to the United States and across a staggering political spectrum, the annual Burns Supper is a ritual unlike any other offered to a poet. And the Burns Club of Atlanta, which I must give a little mention to, I had the privilege of speaking there in, in 2013, they've even actually built an exact replica of Burns's Alloway Cottage, and it's, it's pretty convincing. While it's occasionally politically problematic, the popular celebrations of Burns often kept his words alive in partnership with the rigorous work of scholars and of collectors. And few poets can boast such a wide range of appeal from the popular to the academy. In the past, this might have led to some snobbishness in the academy about Burns's place in the canon, though this was certainly not a view held by his contemporaries, such as Wordsworth, whose manifesto to capture the real language of men could not perhaps have found a better inspiration than in Burns himself. And my esteemed colleague, Jared McKeever, a recent recipient of the Scottish Romanticism Award here at Bars, has pointed to the fact that Burns's presence in, when Wordsworth was traveling in the borderlands of Dumfries and Galloway, weighed heavily on Wordsworth. And it's these cross-cultural influences in Burns's work that have formed an important strand in the modern study of his work in recent years. Burns's poetic language was carefully chosen 
it was chosen as the occasion required. And in the same poem, he might code switch between Scots and English, or very consciously the extent of the use of his vernacular language for poetic effect. Certainly, as Burns's editor, Rona Braun, has discovered, Burns's contemporary editors attempted to convince him not to write in Scots for fear of alienating London readers. Now, I, for one, am very thankful that he refused to acquiesce in this matter because we can see how linguistic code switching is used subversively in his poetry. Um, poems like To a Mouse, Don't Turning Up Her Nest with the Plow, for example, might first appear to be a typical sentimental poem, but as Nigel Leask has shown, Burns is drawing a parallel here between a field mouse made homeless by a plowman and then the predicament of the tenant farmer himself, a victim of agricultural clearance. And a lot of this rests on Burns's ability to code switch between Standard English and Scots for full effect. Though I'm going to apologise now for my Scottish reading. We sleek at car and timorous beastie, oh what a panic's in thy breasty. Thou needna start away so hasty with bicker and brattle. I would be lath to rin and chase thee with murder and paddle. And this gives way to, I'm truly sorry man's dominion has broken nature's social union and justifies that ill opinion which makes thee startle at me, thy earth, poor earth-born companion and fellow mortal. Burns is shifting adroitly from the sentimental to the discourse of the Enlightenment philosophy and he's echoing Adam Smith's idea of the social union whilst also uh, foreshadowing romantic ideas of the unity of self and nature. But the poem leads the reader on a rather desolate note as the speaker breaks his moment of sympathy with the animal to point to a greater uncertainty faced by the tenant farmer. Still thou art blessed compared with me, the present only toucheth thee, but och I backward cast my e on prospects drear, and forward though I canna see, I guess and fear. The Burns' code switching and its potential to convey a radical subtext to seemingly sentimental poetry was not lost on his contemporary radical audience. Poets like James Orr and Samuel Thompson, both of whom were Irish Republicans and involved in the 1790s Brotherhood of the United Irishmen, they turned the subversive use of braid Scots, which was spoken in their particular area, to explicitly Irish political subject matter. The Odes to a Hedgehog and to the Potato, both written about 1798, are replete with Irish nationalist symbolism and popular radical iconography. Thompson's poem in particular uses his own familiarity with natural history to depict a hedgehog in distress, foraging by day for its survival. The poem has been read as a political allegory for the beleaguered and defeated United Irishman, counselling him to creep awa the way you came and tend your squeaking pups at him. For the reader with knowledge of the Scots language, they can decode more than a hint of looking toward the next generation to continue the struggle. Now, Burns's radical contemporaries have often been mischaracterised as bardolaters, but it's unsurprising that his work produced such affinity. I mean, he exploded contemporary myths about working class reading culture and the ability to appreciate ideas. His work also, and this is important, it, it opened up a longer tradition of Scottish literature, particularly his promotion of the works of Robert Ferguson, who he calls my elder brother in the muse. It's worth remembering, of course, that Burns's predecessor, Alan Ramsey, was in fact one of the most widely printed Scottish poets in Ireland at this time. But Burns's working class status, his intricate use of language and his appeal across the emotional spectrum represented a model par excellence to poets from that same background. Likewise, for many poets across the British Empire, Burns created a space in literary culture for people like them. For those who shared his confessional identity, no longer were the rude Northern man mannerisms, or should I say dour reputation of dissenting Scottish Presbyterianism, simply something to be sneered at by an Anglican establishment, but it could also form the basis of sentimental celebration of pride in honest rural hard work, such as the Cotter's Saturday Night. And at the same time, it could inspire a stinging satire on religious fanaticism and hypocrisy.
such as the masterpiece Holy Willie's Prayer. That's one of my favourites. But even Burns's most devout Presbyterian readers were prepared to forgive his sporting freely with the sacred pages in favour of a taste of his satiric genius. The poet Alexander Kemp had visited Burns and attempted to get a manuscript of Holy Willie's Prayer published in the newspapers. He'd taken this down from memory in the presence of Burns. One editor, on declining to publish Burns's poem, opined that while it professes no small degree of merit, it is not fit for publication. Holy Willie's Prayer and the Cotter Saturday Night are a sad comparison, he says. Nevertheless, the poets who had tried to get this thing published transmitted the verses among themselves, and notably their oral version is actually much more, it contains much more Scots vocabulary than the version that has come down to us in print. Well, modern readers would scarcely be so scandalised by religious satire, but they might be less comfortable with some of Burns's bawdy verses. For example, The Lass Who Made the Bed, where the poetic persona is chasing a serving girl around the room in a manner that might just give those of us in the Me Too era a little bit of pause. Again, Burns enthusiasts have had to grapple with evidence that a man who had authored The Slave's Lament and a man's a man for all that earlier in his career had considered emigrating to Jamaica to escape difficulties at home. When this was made public by Jerry Carruthers, the Burns scholar was described by one writer as dancing on popular myth with tackety boots. That, I tell you, is an image that has stayed with me. The great uh, Burns collector Frank Shaw challenged people in response to this. He said, this may challenge you. It may alarm you. It might outrage you. It might threaten your beliefs or it might make you a better student of Burns. Burns, who wrote so well of what it is to be human, was certainly not infallible. And like many of his poetic contemporaries, conveyed a nation with all its contradictions. As he would put it himself, or would some power the gifty geus to see ourselves as others see us, it would frame many a blunder free us and foolish notion. In today's world of social media cancel culture, if I can be a bit provocative, it seems to me that it's ever more important that we encourage others to read more critically, read against the grain, and read more generously, rather than ignoring problematic legacies or even discounting these voices altogether. Time and again, when Burns' contemporaries describe what he meant to them, they allude to the language of simplicity and honesty. Phrases like real feelings of the heart, in which they recall moments in their lives when times are tough. And Burns's words serve almost as a self-contained language among poets used for advice and consolation. The letters that I've studied in particular have been from political exiles, for example, who quote Burns to fortify themselves against persecution in their new countries. Others are friends consoling one another on deathbeds. As the poet John Getty wrote to the terminally ill Samuel Thompson, God grant that you and I may meet in a happier and better world where to use the expression of Burns, worth of the heart is a lone distinction of the man. So if I may be a bit self-indulgent and um, end on a bit of a personal note, for me, Burns's poetry is at its most powerful when it tackles the bigger questions. Questions about unfairness, questions about abuses of power. And these are topics that I think we can all agree certainly have not been resolved in our own era, however enlightened we might like to think we are. So I'll finish with some lines taken from Man Was Made to Mourn. Many and sharp the numerous ills inwoven with our frame. More pointed still, we make ourselves regret, remorse, and shame. And man whose heaven erected face, the smiles of love adorn, man's inhumanity to man makes countless thousands mourn. If I'm designed, yon lordling slave, by nature's law designed, why was an independent wish e'er planted in my mind? If not, why am I subject to his cruelty? scorn? Or why has man the will and power to make his fellow mourn? 
So if you'll please join me, raise your glasses or mugs, in my tacky case, as I propose a toast to the immortal memory of Robert Burns. Thank you so much, Jenny. That was so uh, wonderful and so thoughtful and thought provoking um, and, and lots to think about. And I think you did a much better job at reading the poetry than, uh, than I did. Um, you've just got that lilt. Um, so the uh, next um, toast is from Jerry and it is a toast to the lassies. Okay. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank, you. Thanks, Jenny. That was great. Um, yeah, uh, well, I'd like to start by thanking Andy very, 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 very much for handing me this poison chalice. Uh, the Address to the Lassies, a man talking to and about women for several minutes. What could possibly go wrong? Um, now, <clears throat> there are various approaches here. Uh, sometimes the speaker makes uh, wafer thin case for a feminist Burns. Uh, he did love the lassies, after all, um, which of course must involve Burns's distinctly average, by his standards, 1792 poem, The Rights of Women, with its tired even for 1792 emphasis on the delicate frailty of the sex. Uh, opening thus, while Europe's eye is fixed on mighty things, the fate of empires and the fall of kings, while quacks of state much east produce his plan, and even children lisp the rights of man, amid this mighty fuss, just let me mention, the rights of women merit some attention. <laughs> so with that clearly out of the question, um, and hoping to avoid as much as possible the vibe of the drunken uncle, I racked my brains for something I actually know about for today. Aha! I thought, Scottish romanticism. That's it. That's me. Um, see, the thing is, for all Scottish romanticism's emancipatory rhetoric about breaking the big six and generally moving the conversation in romantic studies uh, beyond Dorothy's brother, it does run a risk of recreating the exact same problems in the creaky English romanticism that it butts against. Um, you know, with the help of brilliant major scholarly editions over the last few decades, we're now presented with a new and improved romantic superhero squadron, Scotland style. Robert Burns, James Hogg, Walter Scott, and John Galt. As the anonymous audience member is said to have responded at the opening night of John Holmes Douglas in 1756, where is your Willie Shakespeare new? But might there not be a way to mitigate this sausage fest? In 1804, the music publisher George Thompson, famously uh, one of the two main editors of Burns' songs, wrote to Joanna Bailey asking for lyrics for his volumes of national melodies featuring arrangements by composers of the stature of Haydn. Bailey replied simply, to the friend of Burns and my own countryman, it is impossible to refuse. Now the fact that Thompson turned to Bailey, uh, I think nicely underlines her status as a real literary heavyweight in the period. She is of course best known now, as then, as a dramatist. But Bailey maintained a slightly peculiar reputation as at once arguably Britain's most respected playwright, making a key contribution to the Shakespeareanization of romantic culture, but also one who hardly ever got a play staged. This seeming paradox becomes slightly less confusing, of course, when we factor in the dubious reputation of the early 19th century theatre. John Galt, for example, wrote of the mid 18 teens that the inferiority of the performances was universally admitted. So in one sense, uh, Bailey could perhaps count her blessings for avoiding the tarnish of the public stage. So as I say, I was going to talk about Joanna Bailey today. Uh, 
But then I remembered what Virginia Woolf says in chapter five of A Room with a View, where she's talking about expanding the terms of history to include women. Not more bloody literary celebrities, says Woolf. And I quote, after all, we have lives enough of Jane Austen. It scarcely seems necessary to consider again the influence of the tragedies of Joanna Bailey upon the poetry of Edgar Allan Poe. As for myself, I should not mind if the homes and haunts of Mary Russell Mitford were closed to the public for a century at least. And so I thought, <laughs> shit. Uh, but then I realised that my topic had been staring me in the face all along. I'm working uh, on library borrowing records just now, and I'm very interested in a group of 14 women, many of them widows, who subscribed to the Wigton Subscription Library in Southwest Scotland in the early decades of the 19th century. Even though they could not attend the library's boozy sounding general meetings and had to deputise a man to make their voices heard in the matter of selecting books for purchase. Take Mrs Blair, for example, uh, who's recorded at an address in Wigton itself, who with 222 book loans between 1828 and 1836 was one of the library's mega users. Mrs Blair can be seen working her way through Scott, Burney, Galt, Ferrier, Hogg, Owenson, Edgeworth, Godwin, Amelia Opie, Swift, Washington Irving, Fenimore Cooper, Smollett, Fielding, Henry Mackenzie, Jane Porter and many others. The figure of the female novel reader was of course a controversial meme in the period, but here in a remote part of Galloway, Mrs Blair and her fellow female subscribers were undeterred voracious members of the expanding reading nation. Finally, I had a topic, but then I realised that I had run out of time. <laughs> so what else is there to do but drink? Cheers! <laughs> Thank you so much, Jerry. I think you uh, navigated that poison chalice with a plum. Um, and like, what, what are you drinking? Is it iron brew? Naturally, yes. I'm afraid Excellent. I'm doing dry January, so it is iron brew today. Oh, iron, iron brew is acceptable as, as the Scottish drink or the, the Scottish soft drink, I suppose. So our next speaker is uh, Rita, who is going to reply to the laddies. Hi, everyone. Um, so first of all, uh, can everyone hear me just to check? Yes, excellent. Um, so th first of all, thank you so much uh, to Andy for inviting me to do this. Um, I was very relieved to hear that uh, Jerry was also a bit nervous about his address since I wasn't really sure what to do. Uh, I am now less happy uh, after having heard it because it was so good then I have no idea how I'm going to follow it. Um, but I'm going to do my best. So um, I'm going to share my screen and hopefully you will all be able to see it. Just a second, I'll move this away, okay. Oh, okay. Can everyone see that? Okay. okay, so um, when I was very kindly asked to present on masculinity in Scottish literature, my favourite Scottish book by my favourite Scottish author immediately came to mind. And maybe there would be a nicer way of starting a contribution to a celebration for Robert Burns than by admitting that he's not my favorite Scottish author of all time, much as I love him. Uh, but my favorite is the um, 1824, The Inheritance by Susan Ferrier. So I'll be focusing on that for uh, a little bit. So in this novel, the heroine Gertrude uh, moves to Scotland to inherit an estate valued at 20,000 a year as I would also very much wish I could do. 
And throughout the novel, Feria describes the pretty poor ways in which Gertrude manages the estate, but also how the men in the family position themselves in relation to her newly gained power. And Feria opens the novel with some words that might sound familiar to you. And um, of course, I had to bring this up as an Austrian person, and I apologize in advance. It is a truth universally acknowledged that there is no passion so deeply rooted in human nature as that of pride, whether of self or of family, of deeds done in our own bodies, or deeds done in the bodies of those who lived hundreds of years before us, all find some foundation on which to build their Tower of Babel. So much like Jane Austen in Pride and Prejudice, Ferry uses the first line of her novel to denote what the focus of it will be, classist notions of self-superiority. And these notions of self-superiority are a large part of the characterization of many of the men in the novel who think of themselves as being superior because of their class, yes, but also because of their gender. And the first person Gertrude is introduced to when she arrives in Scotland is her uncle, Lord Rossville, who is characterized as one of the sticklers for man's superiority and as someone who objectifies Gertrude and her mother from the minute they enter his house. Mrs. St. Clair and her daughter were therefore no small acquisitions to his family. He looked upon them as two very fine pieces of wax, ready to receive whatever impression he chose to give them. While Gertrude is full of enthusiasm when she first arrives at the estate and is blown away by its magnificence, this quickly gets dampened when she realizes she's widely regarded as just a temporary recipient of the property. She has actually, without her knowledge or consent, been promised in marriage to her oldest cousin, Mr. Delmore. A marriage to him would mean that most of the power over the property would be transferred from her to her cousin, since by Scottish law, all of a woman's movable property is placed under the control of her husband. We know that Ferrier was a fan of Austen's, and while their works are very different, we can see the inspiration from Austen in the brilliant way in which Ferrier uses irony in Lord Rossville's communication of his intentions to Gertrude. As Lord Rossville reveals, Gertrude is so far from being considered the legitimate heir of this property that her oldest cousin has actually built his entire political career around the assumption that he will take control over the family estate in the near future. And I think I have only to state to you that the success of this most important political contest depends very considerably upon the understanding that Mr. Delmore will eventually, and in all probability, one day become, through your instrumentality, the lawful possessor of the family estates in this country. Lord Rossville concludes that this is an arrangement which has Mr. Delmore's entire approbation, demonstrating that he considers it necessary to get the approval from Mr. Delmore, but not from the actual inheritor of the property. This episode is deeply ironic, and through it, Feria exposes how well-established prejudices against female ownership often rob women of the few forms of access to property at their disposal. When he realizes that Gertrude isn't super down with this plan, Lord Rossville threatens to alter his will if she doesn't agree to marry her cousin, which puts her in an impossible position. If she refuses, she's disinherited. If she goes through with it, she will also never have control over the property. But fortunately, this uncle dies before he can make good on his promises. So in the end, it's all good. Now, there are a lot of cousins in this novel, too many cousins. Um, and when Gertrude decides not to marry the oldest one, one of the younger ones, Colonel Delmore, begins to court her. And Gertrude becomes a proxy for male acquisition as Colonel Delmore spends all his time lounging about the house and grounds, devising plans for useless expense, which he longed impatiently to put into execution. Ferrier also writes that his every idea centered in self-indulgence and luxury and magnificence were all to which he looked as, as his recompense. Gertrude gets dragged into this lifestyle of excessive consumerism and gets distracted from her initial philanthropic projects, which she had started developing upon inheriting the estate. 
Instead of inspecting the progress of the schoolhouse she had decided to build, she instead goes to inspect a carriage and horses uh, that Colonel Delmore has ordered with her money and to discuss the, con the construction of what she calls a sort of miniature of a femme morne, morne oh my terrible French, um, quite a baby house thing. So once again, Gertrude gets objectified and reduced to her fortune. Sadly, in the end, it's not just Colonel Delmore who gets pu uh, punished for his extravagant lifestyle, but also Gertrude. In the end, for plot reasons that I'm going to keep to myself because I want you to read this book and I don't want, you to, com I don't want to completely spoil it for you, um, Gertrude loses her fortune. Now, Feria was a very religious person and it seems that much as she wanted to make a case for female ownership of property, she wanted even more to put forward ideas, uh, the idea in particular that the pursuit of materialistic pleasures in this lifetime is worthless when compared to the immortal life that she believes one should be working towards. So in the end, Gertrude Mary's cousin number three, um, he's called Mr. Lindsay, and he gets rewarded for not pursuing Gertrude for her fortune by being given her fortune. And while Feria tries to make the point that through Lindsay, the inheritance is once again restored to Gertrude, legally, even when he dies, she will only inherit a part of it. Ironically, through Lindsay's inheritance of the property, the status quo is reinstated, and just as Gertrude's um, uncle wanted, the estate falls once again into male hands. And yet, afraid as Feria apparently was to give us the radical ending the novel perhaps deserved, she invites us to spend 900 pages laughing at men, their prejudices and their illusions of self-superiority. And I think there is a lot of fun to be had in that. That's me. I think that was a, a, a perfect reply to um, the, the the toast laughing at men and um, that brings our sort of um, toasting uh, session to to an end so sort of raise our glasses at the in the in memory of Burns and in celebration of Burns and um, Scottish romanticism more generally and thank you to our wonderful um, toasters and then we're going to sort of have some a gentle introduction to the the sort of poetry reading part of the evening which you're also all invited to as the audience starting with angela and then um going to ainsley and then opening um the floor or whatever this virtual space is called um to everyone else to to share poetry with us which can be burns it can be scottish or it can be um other poetry as um as applicable including your own poetry and Angela has started screen sharing, so is ready to um, perform her uh, the poem that she's chosen. I think. Are you there, Angela? Apologies for that, everyone. Um, I grew up in Lanarkshire. I'm a daughter of Lanarkshire, which is um, adjacent to Ayrshire, where Robert Burns um, came from. So um, I had many Sunday trips to visit Alloway um, where he used to live and like every Scottish school child I was made to learn Tam O'Shanter by rote. So Burns is really in my DNA. But today I wanted to share with you um, a poem in praise of Robert Burns by Janet Little um, who was published by Burns's first publisher um, John and Peter Wilson in Ayr in 1792, and she was called the Scotch Milkmaid. You know, Anne Yearsley was known as the Bristol Milkmaid. Janet Little was the Scotch Milkmaid. And I think that was a little bit of self-fashioning because it's there in the title page of her poetical works. Now, Janet Little was a huge fan of Robert Burns and indeed enamoured of him. In her poetical works, there are two specific poems about Robert Burns. And um, the second one, which is longer, which I'm not reading today, 
but you might want to look up is called An Epistle to Mr Robert Burns and begins um, with a line that may seem, you know, reminiscent of the address to the haggis that Andy read out at the beginning. Fair far the honest rustic swain, the pride of our, our Scottish plain. But that's a really long poem and quite a complex one. So today I'm focusing upon a shorter one, which is really interesting in terms of somebody who is really in love with somebody and who indeed is unafraid and unashamed to express her sexuality and a slightly masturbatory dream that she has about Robert Burns in anticipation of going to visit him. So here we go. This poem is called On a Visit to Mr Burns. And this is a visit that took place, but, but was disappointing because Burns fell off his horse and broke his arm. Is it true, Janet Little writes, or does some magic spell my wandering eyes beguile? Is this the place where deigns to dwell, the honour of our isle? The charming Burns, the muses care of all her sons of pride. This pleasure oft I've sought to share, but been as oft denied. Oft have my thoughts at midnight hour to him excursions made. This bliss in dreams was premature and with my slumbers fled. Um, yeah. Tis real. No vision here bequeaths a poignant dart. I'll view the poet ever dear, whose lays have changed, charmed my heart. Hark, now he comes, a dire alarm, re-echoes through his hall. Pegasus kneeled, his rider's arm was broken by a fall. The doleful tidings to my ears were in harsh notes conveyed. His lovely wife stood drowned in tears while thus I pondering said, No cheering draught with ills unmixed can mortals taste below. All human fate by heaven is fixed, alternate joy and woe. With beating breast I viewed the bard, all trembling did him greet. With sighs bewailed his fate so hard, whose notes were ever sweet. And that's it. I think it's a really interesting poem because it becomes more about her disappointment at not getting to spend quality time with Mr Burns than about um, real concern at his fate of breaking his arm. But it's also really interesting, I forgot to mention before, but Robert Burns, in fact, subscribed to this edition of her poetry. Well, that's that's fantastic. I I I, I don't think I've never heard of the poet before, but I'm going to have to look her up as, as you were as you were suggesting before um, we we started properly. That that fits well with my interest in ridiculousness of all uh, of all shades. I thought that's fantastic. Thank you so much. Um, okay, our next uh, poetry reader is um, Ainsley. Who I hope is here. And it's going to appear. You mean? Oh, I can hear. I could hear. I could hear a bit. Uh, uh, I could hear somebody saying, "Can you hear me?" Can you hear me? Yeah. Yeah. Can you hear me? Just. Oh no, now answering. I can't hear you. It's been really disorientated tonight. When I first joined you all, I could see you all. Um, I'm having really bad internet problems this end. Uh, sorry, two minutes. Can you hear me now? Yeah, we can definitely now? hear you. I might, if, ev if everyone turns off, if we all, if the rest of us turn off our camera, it might give you a little bit extra bandwidth. So I'll, I'll switch off my camera. Sure. And then we, we might be able to hear your poem. Oh, right, brilliant. I'm so sorry about this, guys. No, no worries. Yeah. I can all right, fine, fine, thank you. I um, appreciate that. Yes, yeah, no, this has never happened before. I suppose it's a first time for everything, but technology has absolutely failed me tonight. Um, but yeah, like everyone else, Andy, thanks so much for uh, thanks for putting the night together. 
Ed for inviting me to come back and participate again. Um, it's been loads of fun again, listening and lovely to listen to everyone's everyone's uh, contributions so far. Um, when you uh, first kind of uh, told me you were putting together the second um, uh, sort of run of the, the Burns Digital Night, Andy, you suggested I might want to read something Scottish, something by Burns uh, you suggested. And of course, that seems absolutely more than appropriate for, for tonight's event. And, and with that, really, um, I, well, I had to do no more than look to Pauline Mackay's um, recently published book. I hope you can all see this. Um, called Burns for Every Day of the Year. Um, it's a lovely, it's a lovely book. It's beautiful to look at, but it's also just so thoughtfully put together. Um, Pauline's um, selected excerpts from Burns' poems and his songs and his prose, and it just kind of offers. It's just a really, it's a lovely, it's a very different way of engaging with the man and his legacy. So if you get the opportunity to to get yourself a copy of this, I highly, I highly recommend it. So it's really Pauline has done the work for me uh, for tonight. She's selected a, a brilliant wee poem uh, for the 27th of January. So I think it's very appropriate uh, for the spirit of tonight's event as well. Just a wee excerpt from a poem that um, Burns wrote in 1785 called Scotch Drink. Now, to my shame, I have to admit that I hadn't um, come across this poem uh, before, uh, reading it in Pauline's uh, volume. This, uh, well, it's a very affectionate, very funny tribute to Scotland's national I'm going to pronounce uh, everything correctly, but I'll give it my best drinking at home um, and have a wee kind of you know, celebration at the end of it. Okay, here we go. So here's my attempt at the uh, Scotch drink. Let other poets raise a fracas Bacchus. A crabbed names and stories rackets and great our lug. I sing the juice Scotch beer. Oh, thou my muse, good old Scotch drink, whether through wimpling worms thou jink, or richly brown ream o'er the brink, till I lisp and wink to sing thy name. Let husky wheat the hawks adore, and eight set up their ony horn, and more or fume the plain. Leaves me on the ass yeah, Scotland choose our good in simple scones the whale of food. Or tumbling in the boil of flood with kale and beef. But when there pours thy strong heart's blood, there thou keeps us living. The life's a gift no worth receiving when heavy drag of pain and grieving. But oiled by thee, the wheels of life down the hill go screaming with rattling glee. Thou clears the head, O oh doitered leer. Thou cheers the heart, O oh drooping care. Thou strings the nerves of labour sear at weary's toil. So even brightens dark's despair with gloomy smile. So that, that's it. I hope you all were able to hear that. That's my wee contribution to tonight. So cheers to all of you here. Thank you so much, AT. I think we 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 just made that with with sort of Zoom technology, um, sort of get getting us there. And um, thank you, Jenny, for for putting the poem in the um, the chat for us to uh, follow along. That was a, a fabulous reading. Thank you so much. We 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 we've, we've got there. Um, that was really good. Um, fantastic. So that is that. That's basically all of the the the, the planned toasts and poetry readings um, for the um, evening. It's sort of that now it, it is time to sort of open the floor and and say, is there anyone amongst you who wants to read a poem or has a poem that they want to? I suppose has a poem that they want to read out, which we we sometimes do with questions in Zoom format now. That you can you can make one of us, probably me, perform if you if you want to, but. Um, it's sort of this is a sort of time to sort of share poetry as you would at the end of a traditional sort of Burns night. I think that's one of my fa one of my favourite aspects of a of a Burns night in person is when we've had the we've had the haggis, neeps, and tatties. We uh, maybe we've had the cronacan, which is a delicious Scottish dessert, uh, and we settled down with a whiskey and some poetry and um, shared um, and, and share the poems that we enjoy in poetry that we like. 
And last year, we certainly had some good ones. We had some sort of poetry that was written by the person who was delivering it. We had poetry that was, was just an example of, of poems that um, people enjoyed. We had Burns poems, we had Scottish poems, but we also had sort of poems from um, around the world. And that's sort of, I guess, one of the, the nice things about a modern Burns night that it can rove around the, it can rove around the world and, and, and share poetry from sort of anywhere. Is anyone going to is anyone going to be brave and and read a poem, essentially, including my uh, wonderful sort of panelists who who've who've given toasts and read poems already? We can have we, we can have we can hear more from them, or I will I, I will work through my books that I, that I have ready until someone gives in. I I have no more poems memorized. It's only it's only addressed to the haggis that lives in my mind. Oh, Nick Dodd says, I'll be brave and read John Burnside. Fantastic. If you want to un unmute and maybe appear on camera, uh, Nick, you can you can absolutely um, read some um, John Burnside. And then we'll have uh, Marina, who has the hand up. Can you hear me? Yeah. OK, um, this is from John Burnside's collection, Learning to Sleep. And um, it's a poem called Heather Blether for Erland Cooper, and it goes like this. No way of knowing for sure that the story is true. A lost girl walking away in the first gray light, daughter or sister, crossing an open field with a basket of apples. There for a moment, then vanished. A gap too sudden to be altogether final, and yet the days run on, her laughter fading, silence, hanging in the hallway like a fog. And where is the father or brother who never dismissed the likeness of some half-life in himself? Some rumor of a silky carried home from childhood, bright and fleeting as the first rose of the year. In the kingdom of myth, her body remembers itself as somebody's ghost, wet sleet falling for days at a faraway window. No mothering brimful enough to guide her when she dips into the blue of utterance, still cradling a sip of honey from the hive she left untold. A memory traced all the way to childhood and the last bright summer, grasses golden to the root, a kestrel hunting in a wind she always thought of as particular to home. Years may go by, they hear her through the tides, not quite the call they wanted, thin and distant, like that ache behind the lungs that never comes to song. But out on the sea lanes, farther than compass or chart, a bell rings close at hand, or so it seems, or else a voice from nowhere, bright and sudden, in a sudden bank of ha. And still the men go fishing in their low, wide vessels at the far edge of their world, searching for some new harbour where the seal folk gather close to shore, their faces silent and sad, as we are, and yet so graceful, when they venture from the herd, so graceful and so like, as we are like, but any man could think of them as kin. That's the end. <laughs> thank you so much, Nick. And thank you for being uh, brave enough to be our first uh, sort of non-invited -in -in speaker. I think that was wonderful. Oh, and a, a really cheers. Wonderful <laughs> and cheers. <laughs> I'm very jealous of your bookshelves behind, um, which I enjoyed in the, in, in the background. Um, Marina had her hand up as well and says that she might attempt some R.L. Stevenson, which sounds like a sort of fantastic development from Burns, as it were. So if you'd like, if you'd like to unmute at least and maybe um, give us a sight of bookshelves if you have them behind you, um, that would be fantastic. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, no, no bookshelves, but the Bergamo skyline. Oh, fantastic. Uh, not, not always so sunny, not today anyway. Uh, but yeah, I... I just wanted to thank you all for this great event, for this great opportunity. I do miss Burns Nights. I no longer live in Scotland. Uh, I miss Kayleigh's as well. 
uh, but that's a different story. There's usually a Burns Knight Kaylee as well. Uh, so we cannot do that um, through Zoom, unfortunately. But I thought I would, um, as a way to, to thank you all and thank our poets, I thought I would choose the third Robin after Robert Ferguson, Robert Burns, Robert Louis Stevenson. And I thought I would choose from the website, from the Stevenson website, I would choose a poem from Underwoods. And I thought I would choose this. Uh, it's actually the Macar to Posterity and it's page 76, 77. And I do apologize for my very, very rusty Scots, but it's just a, a, a thank you token, you know, just, just to, to, um, to be part of this. So here goes and thanks for your patience. Um, please be merciful. So far yon among the years to be when all we think and all we see and all we love has been done a G by times look shooter, and what was reached and wrong for me that is mangled through there. It's possible, it's hardly mere, that some in raping after Lear, some old professor or young year, if still there's either, may find and read me and be sere, perplexed, poor breather. What tongue does your old book you speak? He'll spear. And I, his mood to stick. No being fit to write in Greek, I wrote in Lullan, dear to my heart as the peat reek, old as Tantalan. Few spoke it then and knew their name. My poor old songs lie o'er their lane, their sense that ace was broad and plain, tint all together like rooms upon a standing stain among the heather. But think not you the bread to spill, you too man chose the bitter peel. For all your leer, for all your skill, your name is so lucky. And things are maybe hard than well for you, my bucky. The hell concern with hens and hags, with books and raters, stars and clags, new stackers upon loosened legs and wears away. The talk of mankind near the dregs, Lin's uncle law. Your book, that in some bro new tongue you wrote or printed, preached or sung, will still be just a bairn and young in fame and years when the hail planet's guts are dung about your years. And you, sir, grabbing to a spar or whammeled with some blazing star, crying to ken where the dale you are, him, France or Flanders, Quang Sindri like a railway car and fly in denders. Apologies. Thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. That was fabulous. No need for any apologies. That was fantastic and lovely to hear from Stevenson. Um, do we have that? I, I can see no other hands up, and no, no one said. Um, it's, uh, no one's offered anything in the chat. Do we have an, uh, another volunteer? I'll give people a moment to sort of gather their, gather their courage. Raina, you've got your hand up. Would you like to sort of, you can unmute or you, and you can, you can sort of turn your camera on if you wish. Um, you don't have to, uh, but yes, like re, re, give us a poem as it were. Thanks. I won't be turning my camera on because I'm sitting here in the dark. So you basically just <laughs> anyways. Um, I'm going to read a sonnet by Charlotte Smith. Uh, written on the occasion of Burns' death. Um, the sonnet is, co is called um, To the Shade of Burns. Mute is thy wild harp now, O bard sublime, who amidst cautious mountain solitude, great nature thought to build the lofty rhyme, and even beneath the daily pressure, brood of laboring poverty, thy generous blood, fired with the love of freedom. Not subdued were thou by the low fortune, with a time like this we live in, when the abject chime of echoing parasite is best approved, was not for thee. Indignantly is fled thy noble spirit, 
and no longer moved by all the ills of which thine heart has bled. Associate worthy of the illustrious dead, enjoys with them the liberty it loved. Thanks. Sorry, I've unmuted. Um, that was fabulous, Raina. Thank you so much. It's so nice to hear some um, Charlotte Smith, and that was sort of perfectly um, chosen for um, the evening. Brilliant. Is there any? Is there hands up for volunteers? I can. There's there was a lot of clapping for uh, Raina's um, poetry reading. That was fab. Oh wow! Abel Fazi, would you like to read out your the, the poem that you put in the chat, or would you have you just put it in the chat to um, to sort of to have us sort of interested? Oh, uh, now you you you've put me on the spot and said that can I can I read it? Okay, well I, this is my I I am reading it for the first time as I read it aloud now, so uh, apologies for sort of stumbling over um, things. Who who's it by? Are you going to give give me some sort of details? Keats. There we go. I should probably know that as a romanticist and, and apologise for revealing my obvious ignorance. Yeah, fantastic. So this is Keats on Burns. This mortal body of a thousand days now fills, O Burns, a space in thine own room where thou didst dream alone on budded bays, happy and thoughtless of thy day of doom. My pulse is warm with thine old barley brie. My head is light with pledging a great soul. My eyes are wandering and I cannot see. Fancy is dead and drunken at its goal. Yet can I stamp my foot upon thy floor? Yet can I ope thy window sash to find the meadow thou hast tramped o'er and o'er? Yet can I think of thee till thought is blind? Yet can I gulp a bumper to thy name? Oh, smile among the shades, for this is fame. <gasps> What a, what a great way of raising a toast. So I will, I will raise a bumper to Burns uh, from, from Keats. And thank you for sort of giving me that poem to read. This is like new sport where you can make me read stuff. Oh, thank you. So Matt has enabled live transcription. Um, so if you'd like that, you can turn that on um, or off using the toolbar. Oh, and I got I got a red red rose as well. Thank you so much um, for uh, for that reading. Anyone else want to make me perform? It's like I'm your sort of monkey for the evening, um, or read out um, your own um, choice. We've gone quite serious. I could read a comic poem. I've got like a, a, a an old book of comic verse, and this is my. Um, this is oh yeah, Matt is just um, it, googling Rochester poems. For me, you can read that yourself, Matthew. I'm going to read my wife's favourite poem or my wife's go-to poem, um, especially for a Burns night, um, from the Kingfisher Book of Comic Verse, which we've owned for years. And this is a poem by Sydney Hodds, and I don't know any other Sydney Hodds um, poems, but I do know this. And at one point, I think I had this almost memorised. It's called Mashed Potato Slash Love Poem. So slash love poem. If I ever had to choose between you and a third helping of mashed potato, whipped lightly with a fork, not whisked, and a little pool of butter melting in the middle, I think I'd choose the mashed potato, but I'd choose you next. That's, that's, that's the, the, like some comic poem, also about um, dinner, which I'm clearly thinking, starting to think about, it being sort of after, um, after six o'clock and a burned supper being promised me. But so we, we can do lighter poems as well as um, as well as serious poems and elegies. Any more um, volunteers? If Matt has found a Rochester poem, he can read it out. The Imperfect Enjoyment. I can't remember any other Rochester poems. That was the first one that came to me. Yes, um, Jenny says your bluff's been called, Matt. I, I, I've laid down the challenge, read out a Rochester. Or an Afro Ben, she also does some fun um, poems. They work well together. I'm sort of having flashbacks to my sort of 17th century poetry um, seminars. <laughs> Phoebe says it's all about senior dildo when it comes to Rochester. You'd be welcome to read that out, Phoebe. I think... Um, Burns and his already mentioned bawdy poems would approve. Or 
or I could sort of get I could get out my Eddie Reader CD, which has frozen butter on it. That's a, some burns, some burns body. I'm gonna like with 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 more of a pause. I'm just gonna have to work through my stack of poems. Hey, someone's got a hand up. Rebecca, would you like to um, read out a poem? Hello, how is my audio? Perfect. Okay, so in the spirit of the, the brave um, sharing, I'm going to read a poem that I haven't read in years, and I don't think I've ever read out loud. Um, so, but I've been inspired by you all, and I'm really happy to be here. So I'm going to share. This is Edward Rushton. I had to quickly find it in my Google Drive. Okay, so this is the opening poem of the 1824 collection. To the memory of Robert Burns. Neath the green turf, dear nature's child, sublime, pathetic, artless, wild, of all thy quips and cranks despoiled, cold dost thou lie, and many a use, and maiden mild, shall o'er thee sigh. Those powers that eagle winged could soar, that heart which ne'er was cold before, that tongue which caused the table's roar, are now laid low, and Scotia's sun shall hear no more thy rapturous flow. Warned with a spark of nature's fire, from the rough plow thou didst, didst aspire to mark a sordid world, admire, and few like thee. Oh, Burns, have swept the minstrel's lyre with ecstasy. Ere winter's icy vapors fail, the violet in the uncultured dale so sweetly scents the passing gale that shepherds' boys, led by the fragrance they inhale, soon find their prize. So, when to life's chill glens confined, thy rich though rough, uncultured mind, poured on the sense of each rude hind such dulcet lays that to thy brow was soon assigned the wreath of praise. Anon, with nobler daring, blessed, the wild notes throbbing at thy breast of friends, wealth, learning, unpossessed thy fervid mind towards fame's proud turrets, bold, boldly pressed and pleased mankind. But what availed thy powers to please when want approached and pale disease? Could these thy infant brood appease that wailed for bread? Or could thy for a moment ease thy war, thy woe-worn head? Applause, poor child of minstrelsy, was all the world e'er gave to thee. Unmoved by pinching penury, they saw thee torn. And now, kind souls, with sympathy, thy loss they mourn. Oh, how I loathe the haughty train, who oft had heard thy witching strain, yet when thy fame was racked with pain, could keep aloof, and I, with opulent disdain, thy lowly roof. Yes, proud Dumfries, oh, would to heaven thou hast from that cold spot been driven, thou mightst have found some sheltering haven on this side tweed. Yet, ah, e'en here poor bards have striven and died in need. True genius scorns to flatter knaves or crouch amidst a race of slaves. His soul, while fierce the tempest raves, no tremor knows. And with unshaken nerve, he braves life's pelting woes. No wonder then that thou shouldst find the averted glance of half mankind, should see thy sly, slow, supple mind to wealth aspire, while scorn, neglect, and want combined to quench thy fire. When wintry winds pipe loud and strong, thy high-perched stormcock pours his song. So thy Aeolian lyre was strung this chilling times, yet cheerly dost thou roll long thy uh, wreath of rhymes. And oh, that wreath of rhymes shall raise for thee a lasting pile of praise. Happily some bard in these our days has higher sword, but from the heart more melting lays were never poured. When Ganges rolls, <clears throat> excuse me, his yellow tide, where blessed Columbia's waters glide, old Scotia's sons prepare far, spread far and wide, shall oft rehearse. With sorrow some, but all with pride, thy witching verse. In early spring, thy earthly bed shall be with many a wildflower spread. The violet there its sweets shall shed in humble guise, and there the mountain daisy's head shall duly rise. 
While darkness reigns, should bigotry with boiling blood and bended knee scatter the weeds of infamy o'er thy cold clay, those weeds at light's first blush shall, uh, shall be soon swept away. And when thy scorners are no more, the lonely glens and sea beat shore where thou hast crooned thy fancies o'er with soul elate, oft shall the bard at eve explore and mourn thy fate. And I believe that's the end. <laughs> that was fantastic. Thank you very much. Uh, uh, Jenny also says Rushton, fantastic. What a, uh, a, a wonderful elegy and, and a wonderful to hear that. Um, fantastic. Um, but yeah, that was really lovely. Um, are there, are there others or do you want another poem from me? I have a stack so I can uh, inflict them on. Where have I got to? I'll do uh, I'll do a Hegley. So I th this is uh, John Hegley, who's sort of a performance poet. Um, I saw him down in Cornwall, and he has um, you you might not be able to see the word, but he he he's sort of put a, an addition onto this um, poem that I really like, and I, I remembered it because one of my um, friends. Um, turned to me as like an English professor uh, because they were going to a, a Burns night themselves and said, can you recommend a poem? Um, and I um, I recommended them this one because I thought it would be a, a fun read. So this is John Hegley and it's called Beliefs and Promises. Um, and I'll read out the um, the edition that he has signed off as um, as appropriate for the poem. It's another funny one. So I'm, I'm breaking up the elegies with sort of comic poems. You can You can stop me by volunteering. So Beliefs and Promises. I believe in dog, the rather all bitey. I believe that saying I will do something makes me less likely to do it. I believe that a bus is less well served, well served by a single operator than if you crew it. But I still believe in thanking the driver when I get off. Although if the exit is through a middle door, you can't make eye contact with your thanks unless you go down to the cabin before leaving, which all seems a bit much for this small courtesy. I believe that Jesus, Jesus would have been a smoker. I believe that Buddha would have been a good goalie. I believe there is a greater hole which I am part of. I believe in not ending sentences with prepositions. I believe that rules are there to suggest the possibility of breaking them, but I don't believe that rules are there to be broken because that's just another rule. I promise to remember that you are beautiful. I promise to remember that I too am beautiful. I promise to be less negative and paranoid. Who are you looking at, bum face? I promise to sing. I promise to dance. I promise to love. I promise to kiss. I promise to think before I speak. I promise to speak before I think. I promise to speak before I speak. I promise to know when to stop. Oh, um, Jerry says um, that he's happy to read the next one. So you've, you've volunteered. You can go for this. OK, sure. Uh, yeah, uh, I was going to read Wordsworth's Ejaculation at the Grave of Burns, but I think the title's the best bet. So I'll do a different one. Um, there's the... The epistle to Hugh Parker has been on my mind recently uh, because I've been doing some research alongside, um, uh, well, a team of people, including a, a building surveyor, and we've uh, found a whole bunch of new archival evidence about Ellisland Farm, about Burns's farm. Uh, we've kind of revised the, the known history of it. We now know that Burns built all the farm buildings and enclosed the field structure that survives today. Um, and it's interesting because this poem, which is one of the first poems he wrote on moving to Dumfrieshire um, after his years in Edinburgh, was thought to have been written from a nearby uh, farm, but in fact, uh, seems to have been in, in a different place altogether. So anyway, this is, he's just arrived in Dumfrieshire at his new farm, and he's not entirely convinced by, uh, by Dumfrieshire yet. The Epistle to Hugh Parker. In this strange land, this uncouth clime, a land unknown to prose or rhyme, where words ne'er crossed the muses' heckles, nor limp it in poetic shackles, a land that prose did never view it, except when drunk he staggered through it. Here, ambushed by the chimla cheek, hid in an atmosphere of reek, I hear a wheel thrum in the nuke, I hear it, for in vain I look. The red peat gleams, a fiery kernel, enhusked by a fog infernal. 
Here for my wanted rhyming raptures, I sit and count my sins by chapters. For life and spunk like other Christians, I'm dwindled down to mere existence. We nae converse but Galwa bodies. We nae ken face but Jenny Geddes. Jenny, my Pegasian pride, dowie she saunters down this side, and I a westland look she throws, while tears hap o'er her old brown nose. Was it for this? We canny care, thou bore the bard through many a shire. At house or hillocks never stumbled, and later early never grumbled. Oh, had I power like inclination, I'd heese thee up a constellation, to canter with a sagittar, or loup the ecliptic like a bar, or turn the pole like any arrow. Or, when old Phoebus bids good morrow, down the zodiac urge the race, and cast dirt on his godship's face. For I could lay my bread and kale, he'd ne'er cast salt upon thy tail. We are this care, and are this grief, and sma, sma prospect of relief, and not but peat reek in my heed. How can I write what ye can read? Tarbolton, 24th of June, you'll find me in a better tune. But till we meet and wheat our whistle, tack this excuse for nay epistle. Thank you. <laughs> that was fabulous. Thank you so much, um, Derry. So I think we're, we're coming to the, to the towards the end of um, the uh, advertised session. I think we've got about like a little bit uh, around 10 minutes left if um, if we need that time. If you if you've got a poem that you've been sitting on and that you're sort of uh, you, you want you wanted to read. Now is the time to um, volunteer. So um, Mar Marina is trying to volunteer someone to to read um, Flighting a Life and Death. Uh, it does require a native speaker, so that's sort of po that's possibly volunteering you again, um, Jerry, or, or or somebody other than me, as, as we've discovered that my um, my, my native Scottishness does not um, get, get poetry. I don't think. So volunteers or volunteers to read their own poems. Or you can make me perform again with sort of one that doesn't require a native speaker. <laughs> or I have, I, I have sorry, I didn't mean today. to embarrass anyone. <laughs> no, that's that's fine, Marina. I really, I, I, I loved your um, your Stevenson um, performance already. I would, I'm, I'm hoping that Matt or Phoebe is going to um, charm us with some Rochester. The gauntlet is still down. That's what I say. Andy, I, I can lower the tone with a really dirty one if you want. Yes. <laughs> so apologies. Um, I thought I, I might read uh, Burns's Dainty Davy, which I warn you is uh, symbolic of something else. Okay, <laughs> so you'll have to you have to forgive me. Being pursued by the dragoons within my bed, he was laid doon, and well I wot he was worth his room, my ain dear dainty Davy. Oh, leaves me on his curly poo, bonny Davy, dainty Davy, leaves me on his curly poo. He was my dainty Davy. My minnie laid him at my back. At true, he lay no long at that, but turned and in a very crack produced a dainty davy. Then in the field among the peas, behind the hoose of cherry trees, again he won a twish my thieves, and splash gave out his gravy. But had I gowed or had a lend, it should be all at his command. I'll ne'er forget what he put in my hand. It was a dainty davy. Oh, leaves me on his curly poo, bonny davy, dainty davy. Leaves me on his curly poo, he was my dainty Davy. My grandmother would be disgusted. Wow. 
that's a, that that's sort of out Rochestering Rochester in a way. Fab. So I'll, I'm gonna in the in the absence of someone. Oh, the, I have a Rochester that's only moderately rude. If that would be welcome, come on, Matthew, read us a moderately rude Rochester. Okay, I will. I will. Can you hear me? Okay. Yeah. I will stay off camera because I have to have this on screen and otherwise I won't be able to see it. So I will just, this is, I think, relatively Burnsy and this is called Against Constancy. Tell me no more of constancy, the frivolous pretense of cold age, narrow jealousy, disease and want of sense. Let duller fools on whom kind chance an easy heart has thrown, despairing higher to advance, be kind to one alone. Old men and weak, whose idle flame their own defects discovers, since changing can but spread their shame, ought to be constant lovers. But we whose hearts do justly swell with no vain glorious pride, who know how we in love excel, long to be often tried. Then bring my bath and strew my bed as each kind night returns. I'll change a mistress till I'm dead, and fate change me to worms. That was fabulous. Thank you so much, um, Matthew. So I'm going to I'm, I'm going to bring the uh, session to the uh, to an end. I'm going to read a serious poem as I keep on reading comic poems. Uh, it's a serious poem, but it's not. A, it, it's again not Burns and not Scottish. It's from last year's um, Catullus Shibari Carmina by um, Isabel um, Williams, and it's a uh, it's her translation of Catullus, sort of illustrated with. Um, um, Japanese rope um, bondage, um, so sort of quite interesting on its own, but this is um, Catullus's, Catullus 101, and it's his elegy to his brother, and I think it's a sort of, um, the whole collection is fabulous, uh, and has illustrations, and is really interesting in lots of ways, um, but I think this is a really beautiful um, elegy, and as we've had so many elegies um, this evening, I thought I'd end with this one, even though it's not a Scottish one, and it's not on Burns, um, but here we go, so this is Catullus 101, Flight shamed through the earthbound ports and checkpoints. I'm here, brother, for this bleak ceremony to help you fathom death's assembly kit and offer useless words to wordless ashes. I wasn't strong enough to keep hold of you. Now I'll never find the missing piece. Here are the conventional sad tokens for the old rituals that told us so. Take them sea splashed with the brother's tears and forever like the tide, my brother, I come to claim you to let you go. And on that note, I will let you go. Um, so perhaps we can raise a bumper again and say here's to Burns and here's to a wonderful evening of Scottish romanticism and conviviality and thank you so much for coming and sharing your poetry with us, your toasts and the immortal memory of uh, Robbie Burns, Jenny. Um, thank you so much and Schlanger. Enjoy your Burns supper, Andy. Thank you so much, Andy. Thanks, Andy. Thank you, Andy. <laughs> Thank you, Andy.